It's indeed a great joy to be here today. I'm so grateful for the friendships that I've made over the years with many of you, not just here at Providence Chapel, but also in various other venues, you know, in different places. And so it's kind of almost like when I come back to be with you guys because of the kindred spirit, you know, you almost feel like it, you're coming home to a family reunion. And so there's just such a camaraderie and a sweetness, a connectivity that we enjoy, you know, when we see uh, you and your families uh, that we've known over the years. I want to say this morning before we just, you know, leave the launching pad here, it's good to have our friend Jennifer who came to the ladies' retreat, and thank you ladies for making her feel so much at home. Uh, we met her in a conference in Los Angeles, California, and so she now lives in Colorado and came to the ladies' retreat here. And then also another dear friend this morning, Marlena, Marlene, is that right? Marlene. Okay. Anyway, she is a dear friend of a precious friend of ours, uh, Bill and Hilda Orr. Um, some of you may remember in the Canadian, Canadian Revival Fellowship, there was a gentleman called the Singing Postman who had a tremendous ministry among children, and he and his dear wife, very godly people, would travel with the Satara twins to many of the crusades as well as their conferences, and we met them over the years. And so Hilda is still living Bill has gone home to be with the Lord, but uh, as a result of Hilda's influence, our sisters come to be with us this morning, and it's a real joy to have you with us, so glad you made it. I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua 24. Sometimes the reading of the text is... Very, very brief, and as Spurgeon said, there is a blessing in brevity. But on the other hand, uh, there are times where we need to read the entire context. And so uh, the reason we should always read it is because most of the time, the best part of a sermon is the reading of the text. We don't mean to be frivolous when we say that. I mean, it really is. I hope you'll get a little bit more out of the message this morning than just the reading of the text. But... If you would, let me direct your attention, please, to Joshua chapter 24. I'd like to read through uh, verse number 28, so follow with me. I'm reading from the New King James this morning, and you'll notice during the course of the message, I have a hodgepodge of translations in the message from ESV to NASB to Old King James, so if you would make that adjustment as we look into the Scripture and consider what God says. Verse number 1, Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. And then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw that I did what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel 
and sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt. From the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also serve the Lord, for He is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you, and after He had done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, Your witnesses, against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve Him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and he set it up under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, this is a formidable opportunity. What a tremendous privilege to stand before this faith family And showcase the jealousy of God. Would you please draw near to your people today? Would you make this a day of your power? By which they are made willing. I am made willing. Would you do a deep work? Penetrating. May the word 
sink deep into our hearts today. Show us our God. I pray, Father, that we might plumb the depths of this among other aspects of the attributes of God. And Father, may we be better men and women as a result. To the praise of the glory of your grace, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you this morning just some thoughts, some aspects that relate to the jealousy of our God. Let me give you from the outset where we're going. This message will have multiple objectives. First, to provide a concise definition of idolatry. What does it mean to be guilty of idolatry? Secondly, I want to underscore the importance of how an ongoing familiarity with the attributes of God affords grace-given motivation in conquering idols. Seems as if if I get a topic for a sermon series in a Reformed context these days, we always begin the very first message with that attribute of God that is most fitting to the need related to that conference. And so we will look at that this morning. Thirdly, here's another thing that I want you to see and not to miss. To understand that what you worship determines your character and your destiny spiritually. I don't know if you've seen the book by G.K. Beale entitled, We Become What We Worship. But he said this, what you revere, you resemble either for ruin or restoration. And then finally, the fourth objective of the message this morning is to see that the greatest means for destroying idols is not moralism, a covenant of works but an ongoing understanding and eternalization of the gospel which comes to us from a vantage point of grace. So we look at these things this morning and let me begin by setting our minds aright concerning the introduction. This faithful account is a fitting conclusion to the life and legacy of Joshua. He has directed the Israelites across the Jordan River, led them to victory over the enemies, and helped them to repossess the land of their ancestors. As a final act of leadership, he calls for the leaders of the tribes of Israel to present themselves before God. Listen carefully. His purpose is to urge them to renew their covenant with him And Joshua begins by reminding them of God's kindness as he highlights Yahweh's goodness and power. This is significant. Listen, God's goodness is revealed in his leading of their fathers, multiplying their descendants and bringing them into Canaan, while his power is demonstrated in the deliverance of his people from the Egyptians sustaining them in the wilderness, and then ultimately defeating their enemies in Canaan. Now, the second thing that Joshua urges them to do is to repent of their idols. The very idols that their fathers worshipped. You'll notice back in verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. This is the charge of Joshua. Fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. You will note in this verse there are three components of genuine repentance that we need to heed. They are reverence, heart, sincerity or integrity, and mortification. You know, as I look at mortification, the Scripture, it's always from a vantage point of grace. It's not to simply encumber us or to impede our joy. 
But when you recognize that the God of wonders and the God of all grace is behind this, it makes you want to mortify sin. It's the grace of mortification. But we continue to make our way through the text. We see that Joshua challenges the people to choose whom they will serve. Once again, look at the text, verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Now watch this. The people's choice to follow the Lord is made in haste. Like so many of us, oftentimes we hear truth, and perhaps it's accompanied with conviction, and we don't take the time to really mill over in our mind to allow it to permeate our very thinking what the cost involved is. So we impulsively make a decision that, Lord, there's going to be a change wrought. I want to know the transforming work of your Spirit in my life. But we're very quick. We're impulsive, haphazard in our decision-making, and yet we don't contemplate the magnitude of what we're doing. So it is here. The people's choice to follow the Lord is in haste, and Joshua cautions them to rethink their words in the light of three aspects. Now watch this. Three aspects of God's character, His holiness, His jealousy, and His wrath. You see this in verses 19 and 20. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after He has done you good. It's not a trivial thing to make a flippant decision. But how often have I done it? How often, perhaps, have you done it? You see, these attributes of God, brethren, are not to be taken lightly. For they provide motivation for the destruction of the gods of these people's fathers. At the end of this passage, note this, at the end of this passage, Joshua establishes three witnesses to make the people's oath binding to serve the Lord. These witnesses are their word, a covenant of works, and a memorial stone. Seemingly this is ordinary stone, but this stone will bear witness against you as to what you promised before the Lord God. In the message here, I want us to see, I continue the introduction. I want you to see how the jealousy of God relates to four things about Him that can lead to a genuine and sustained repentance. That's what I want. That's what I trust you desire. Whether you battle with internet porn, or perhaps there is a relationship that has bellied up and you still suffer, you reel from the remnants of what happened from that trauma, you really want victory if you're in Christ. And you won't sustain victory. So let me begin with a definition of idolatry. Listen very carefully. Idolatry can be defined in light of Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5, when God says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Now listen to this. According to this commandment, the naked truth is to serve any object as a substitute for God is idolatry. It is placing anything before or above the one true God. 
You see, Jesus' words in Mark 12 and verse 30 can be used to also define the subject when he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. But listen. In the light of the greatest commandment, idolatry is the worship of anything or anyone that draws the affections of the heart and thoughts away from Christ. This is significant. It can also be defined as an immoderate attachment to someone or something other than Jesus Christ. In other words, to make it very practical, if I can encourage you to tune in, now listen, an idol is any object that a man savors, serves, and sacrifices for. Anything that you savor, you delight in, you serve, you bow at its feet, it's your master, or anything that you're willing to sacrifice for. Here's an illustration from church history. Young John Wesley approached his mother on one occasion and asked her, Mother, what is sin? And Mrs. Wesley looked at young John and said, Whatever increases a desire for more of itself and less of Christ to you, that is sin. That's idolatry. In seeing now what idolatry is and how it can be defined, let me share with you four things from the text about how divine jealousy, God's jealousy, aids in the destruction of idols. Now listen carefully. Number one, God's jealousy is evidenced by His care. By His care. Look at verse you remember verses 1 through 13. I'll not read them all for you, but let me just reference a few things in this passage. His care is demonstrated in his kindness. He says in verse 3, Joshua speaking, on the behalf of God, that I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him and multiplied his descendants and gave him the fulfillment of promise, namely Isaac. It was a kindness of God. This is the benevolence of the Almighty. Furthermore, in verse 5, he said, Also I sent Moses and Aaron, weak men, pitiful men, an abundance of glitches, however, men that God had ordained and set apart to lead His people as an act of mercy. Also in verse 6, we see, Another kindness, and that is, is, I brought your fathers out of Egypt. I'm the one that did it. It was not something that you could have caused to happen. It was something I did through a strong and merciful hand. And then you'll notice something else about his care. His care is demonstrated in his power. His sheer, raw, awesome power. Verse number 5, I plagued Egypt. Afterward, I brought you out. Verse 7, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea upon them and He covered them. This act of mercy demonstrated in judgment. In verse 12, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your own bow. Listen carefully, it gets better. We'll get to the practical in a moment, but listen carefully. Both of these attributes here, the kindness and the power, are extensions of God's goodness and reveal showcase his jealousy for his people. Until you begin to saturate your mind with the depths of the attribute of God's jealousy, friend, you'll really be inept to conquer things in your life that you see as an impediment to your holiness. 
You see, it is the attribute of goodness, according to Romans 2.4, that God uses to lead to repentance. The intent of God's goodness is to bring repentance of sins. It does not lead us to exasperation if we're in Christ. It doesn't lead His children to a deeper or more aggravated rebellion. Rather, God proves His jealousy by caring for His redeemed. Other passages that we could note, just one here in Titus chapter 3 and verses 3 through 6. This is wonderful. Notice how it's just laced with God's goodness and kindness and loveliness. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish and disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts, various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hatred and hating one another. But after that, the kindness... And love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy hath He saved us. And then we find that this is shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I remember reading, you know, the historical account of the revival among the uh, Susquehanna, Susquehanna Indians there under David Brainerd. And Brandon marked in his diary that when he pressed upon the minds of the Indians the terrors of the law, the demands of God's justice, that they sat there with rapt attention, but unmoved. They were rather wooden in their response. And so he went on and began to expound more and more of the terrors of the law. And it seemed like they sat there they gave attention to what was being said, but once again, unmoved. And there was an absence of any working of the Holy Spirit to make that word effectual. But then Brain had learned something. In his study and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, he came to a point that he began to unveil the beauties of God's infinite love in the person and work of Christ, and he said that's when the Indians begin to melt. There was such a marked difference. And the consequent result was that they repented of their worship. They repented of their own idolatry. It's getting beyond this covenant of works, you see, and recognizing that God has afforded us so much more to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friend, we, 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 we can't be bored about it. I prayed this morning, you know, I mean, this is a message, you know, that I, I preached very little that I brought to you this morning. I said, oh God, please don't make it scripted. I, I want it to make my heart dance. And I, I agree with Lee. I mean, there needs to be some applause of the Savior. I mean, we really ought to be dancing in the aisles this morning. He didn't just leave us with a law of encumbering beauty, but He gave us such beauty in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is the thing that solicits my affections and, and causes me to know sustained mortification in my life over idols. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Don't miss this now. Second thing. God's jealousy is evidenced by His counsel. Not just His care. This is wonderful, his counsel. Verse number 14, now therefore, fear the Lord. Here's the charge. Fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth, without hypocrisy. And put away the idols which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. We prayed this morning before we came to the service, I mean, Literally, the hymn writer was right. Tis mercy all. It is a merciful thing, brothers and sisters, that God would help His children by giving them instruction for preservation from idols. But He does it because He cares for them with a loving jealousy. Get a load of this. He is committed to keep them from anything that would mar the beauty of His holiness in them. 
This counsel that Joshua gives Israel is life-giving for the preservation of their purity. Likewise, every commandment, promise, and warning that God gives us is a mercy to preserve our souls from the insidious effects of idols. Listen to this. Consider these principles of preservation. First of all, he speaks of the fear of the Lord. It entails various words that comprise the definition. This is important. They are revere, awe, and dread. All three make up the fear of the Lord. All three are conveyed in its meaning. You see, revere here suggests the idea of possessing, how about this now, unrivaled wonder. I know I, I'm, I'm kind of a late bloomer and I'm still blooming, but last year I, I, I read the two best biography or autobiography, autobiographies that I've ever read. And, and I finally got around last year to reading the two volumes of Martin Lloyd-Jones by Ian Murray, and then I read the four-volume set of the autobiography of Charles Spurgeon compiled by he and his wife. And, you know, you read those things, and oftentimes people miss this significant point about Lloyd-Jones and Spurgeon. They were epistles of wonder. <laughs> they, they were intentional in their worship, and they took time in their travels to stop and pause and become enchanted by the wonders of God, whether it was creation or judgment or the atoning beauties of Jesus Christ. This is the very thing that propelled them. And I, I was looking for books on wonder, you know, Ted Tripp, Paul David Tripp's got a, got a good book, you know, called Awe. And then, of course, Robbie Zacharias has a, has a book, you know, about wonder, you know. But, but you know, it, it's basically, there's not a lot written on it but to take the time to contemplate God's wonders and particularly his wonders regarding the fear of the Lord. Here, note, it means unrivaled wonder. It speaks of throwing beyond or surpassing the intellect. That's the fear of the Lord. In other words, you try to figure it out, friend, and all of a sudden what overrides your cerebral input is the fact that this is rapturous. This is beyond you. All speaks of an unattainable glory or an infinite otherness. And boy, is that important. But then finally, dread suggests that his person is not to be trifled with. Once again, it goes back to the fact, don't make flippant decisions. It's costly if you do. The text goes on to say, serve him in sincerity and in truth. That's the fruit of good motive. The phrase speaks of a wholehearted devotion that reflects heart fidelity. It is a resolution of the purest intent. And then finally, very basically, if this is not raw and cut to the chase, I don't know what is, but he says, put away your idols. Out of sight out of mind. You see, put away the gods is a natural consequence of a sincere heart. The mortification of an idol is the fruit of unrivaled devotion to the one true God. Brothers and sisters, all true worship involves sacrifice. It's like Ravenhill said, when Abraham took his son up on the mountain there, you remember, he didn't say, let us go and Worship, he said, let us go and sacrifice because there is a sacrifice unmistakably in any act of worship. I remember being in Oklahoma City one time and the pastor was telling me about a girl that they were mentoring with the gospel. She had not come to faith in Christ. She was Asian and she was formerly a Buddhist and she wore her Buddha around her neck. 
And he said, we've been very patient with her. We just kept feeding her the gospel and talking about the importance of repentance and forsaking anything between you and Christ. And one day she came to church. And the thing that stood out was her Buddha was gone. And they inquired, said, we, we notice your Buddha's gone. She said, well, well, what did you expect me to do? I became a follower of Christ last night, and, and nobody told her to do it. Nobody told her to discard her Buddha. But she knew in her heart, I have to part with this idol. And she took the initiative to remove it. Don't, don't you like conversion experiences like that? <laughs> Where it's less and less of what man has manipulated and more and more of what God has done. God's jealousy is evidenced by his counsel. But thirdly, very quickly, God's jealousy is evidenced by his character. Look at verses 19 and 20. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. He's speaking of the wrath of God. Now, men and women, knowing the Israelites' inclination to worship idols, Joshua underscores three attributes of God as mighty deterrence to idolatry. Although each one could be defined and applied separately, I believe that Joshua uses them as vitally linked to one another. It's like a network of reproof to one another in this context as a merciful warning not to forsake their promises. But if the overtures of his jealous love are not responded to, in continued obedience, then the fatal consequence will be God's wrath. And for those of you, maybe you find this very oppressive. Listen, we're not talking about performance here. We're talking about propitiation. We're not talking about perfection. We're, not, we're talking about propitiation. He enables us because of his finished work on the cross. It's not left up to us. We fail, we stumble, we struggle. Do you have time for me to tell you about my failures just in the last 24 hours? No, you don't. Because in a very real sense, they're infinite. I could go on and on. But sin, while it abounds, grace does much more abound. So quickly... God is jealous for all that he has declared holy. He is devoted to the holiness of his name, the holiness of his people, and the holiness of his redemptive purpose in conforming you and I into the image of his Son. Once again, this is very important. You see, to fulfill his promised holiness to his people and glorification, he demonstrated his intent to make them holy through the death of his son. Brothers and sisters, the very definite sense when Jesus suffered the wrath of God on the cross, his father was revealing to the world his jealousy for his people by decreeing to make them a holy nation. That's you and me. He said in essence, I love this, I am jealous for the holiness of my name, my son, and my people. Therefore, the atonement of my son was a declaration of jealousy for my people in one word, mine. They're mine. And I will do everything I can to preserve their holiness. So listen, divine wrath is reserved for, all, reserved for all who find their pleasure in something or someone other than God. 
Wrath is revealed initially when God gives people over to their idols. When this occurs, men become what they worship. Are you with me? Once again, Bill says, we resemble what we revere either to ruin or restoration. And we find this documented in the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 and Revelation 21 and verse 8, just to mention two. Idolaters shall have their part in the lake of fire. But let me conclude with one more thing. Number four, God's jealousy, and this is precious, is evidenced by His covenant with His people. His covenant with His people. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 15, see, God says, I have set you before, I have set you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him and to keep His commandments, decrees and laws, and then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to possess. Although the commandments of Sinai were conditional, they were still a token of divine mercy. Charging us with commandments to preserve our well-being. They fell far short of what God ultimately intended the gospel to produce in our lives. But God commanded, do this and you shall live. This act of divine kindness in the giving of the law revealed the concern of God for His people. But it also revealed man's great need, the need of grace. This required, listen, more than a covenant of works, it called for a covenant of grace. And so now we kind of bring everything home. Understand this morning that the jealousy of God comforts us with this loving affirmation that God is for us. I mean, regardless of what you think of Piper, I mean, the guy's right on. I mean, God is the gospel. I mean, what initiative? You ever think about that? You ever, you ever unpack that theological theme of, of God's initiative? God is for us. I, I mean, at a conference, this young man walks up to me, man, and he just totally wiped out of me. He says to me, he said, I think God's abandoned me. I, I believe I'm reprobate. There's no potential of me being saved. And I said, well, didn't you pay your conference fee to come here? Well, yeah. I said, that's an act of faith. Haven't you come to, to sit and listen? Well, yeah. Well, that's an act of faith. Aren't you seeking to hear from God? He said, yes, I am. That's an act of faith. Let me remind you of just one of many promises in Psalm 9 and verse 10, that they that seek the Lord have not been abandoned by the Lord. I looked at him and I said, brother, God is for you. He starts crying. For me? God's for me? God is for you. You're, you're, you're persevering. You're looking to Him. You're here. Your presence makes a statement. Because you seek Him, He has not forsaken you. So, I wrap this up. This is what I want to encourage you with. Of all the divine attributes that are found in Joshua 24 here, God's jealousy is the most important in dealing with idolatry. Listen, why? Because by understanding how jealous God is for us, we recognize how much He loves us. As a result, we find ourselves more motivated to renounce any idol that takes His place to know Him as a jealous God is to treasure Him who guards over us with infinite love. In the early years when Cindy and I used to travel together, you know, I mean, women just have 
an ability. They can sense the improper motives of females. And, you know, I, I, here I am, I'm walking around just as naive as I can be, but on occasion, not very often, but on occasion, she said, Don, you need to watch that gal. You need to be real, real careful and exercise the utmost discretion. I said, I don't see it. What are you, what are you talking about? Sometimes it wasn't anything she said or anything that she did. It wasn't any type of inappropriate gesture, but you better watch that gal. You know how that made me feel? <laughs> Loved. Amen. <laughs> my wife loves me. She cares for me. If my wife will extend that kind of love and jealousy on my behalf, imagine how much intimate, infinitely more God does toward me. I mean, these are overtures of love, friend. Think about this. There is something that I want to leave you as I close the message. Remember this. Moralism, doing things according to a law, engaging in the performance treadmill, and attempting to overcome idols by a performance-based spirituality not only frustrates the grace of God, but it serves to intensify desire for idols in the battle of your life. <laughs> it frustrates God's grace. And it intensifies. I mean, you want more of it, more of it, more of it. You see, only a covenant transacted by the blood of Christ can guarantee sustained victory over any idol. In other words, conquering power rests only in the gospel alone. We do not overcome once again by our performance, but by His propitiation. Dear people, He has satisfied the wrath of God once and forever. Guess what Christ became? Because he was a product of God's jealousy. He became a bloody pacifier. And Christ was looked upon by his father with such beauty and such value for you and for me. You remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2? Excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul says, I feel a divine jealousy for you. It's interesting, the apostle knew the nature of God's love for his people because to feel jealousy like him is to demonstrate a protective and watchful love for others. So, it is interesting, God's jealousy may be defined as follows. You ready for this? God seeking to protect His honor. Your holiness is His honor. Your well-being is His honor. Your perseverance is His honor. Get on board. Get in sync with what God desires to do in your life. How do I do that, Brother Don? Relish in the jealousy of God. It is a token of His great love. Shall we pray? Our Father, once again this morning, we would ask that You might manifest Your strength through the weakness of this mere mortal, no false modesty, no false humility, a mere pitiful mortal. And I pray, God, that what has been shared, that the Holy Spirit would showcase and unveil the brilliance of to the help and the sanctification and the encouragement of your people to live their lives to the praise of the glory of your grace. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.